Hello and welcome back to the Villa Filler podcast. I'm here as always, my good friend Dan Wiseman. Dan, it's preview time. Unfortunately, it's not going to be Unai Emery's first game. As we know, there's going to be some visa issues. There's there's going to there's you know there's some some legal things to sort out before this guy takes the reins. But I mean, first of all, mate, how are you doing? No, mate, I'm really good. I'm really good. I'm in fine spirits today. I got FM twenty three last night. I caved in and I bought it. Um, so I'm looking forward to a nice day of playing that. Um, obviously, we're back on back on preview GC. It's a new era at Aston Villa. We've got transfer rumour mills coming up. Um, it's all coming up. Millhouse, mate. It's a, we, we feel like we're in good swing. The channel's going really well. It's growing nicely. Um, everything's really good at the moment. So, yeah, I mean, if Villa can back this up with some good results, then, um, yeah, mate, everything will be coming up rosy. It would, wouldn't it, mate? It would. And we've had some good news in recent weeks. Obviously, Bubakar Kamara is now back on the grass and training and he's yes. expected to maybe yes, make yes. that Manchester United game in the Cup is what we're hearing. Luca Dean is also back as well. Begs the question, how serious were those injuries? Were, were we being fed <laughs> lies? I think some people have. Uh, some people feel like Steve may have been stiffed up a little bit there, but I don't think that's the case. But it's fantastic news that they're both back. Uh, there was also talk in the papers as well about Emery, you know, looking to integrate Diego and and Buba fairly early on. So I think that's must be quite telling of how their situations are going. Obviously, a few weeks ago we saw Buba's out of the boot. So everything seems positive there as well, mate. And whilst I wouldn't be rushing to get these guys back, because I think the you know, a recovery is something that I can't claim to know a lot about, but I think we should should take very seriously, especially with the severity of the injuries that were had. It's it's really encouraging news, mate, isn't it? Yeah, 100%, mate. 100%. You have to be really careful how you manage these injuries. Um, but it's really promising that we've, we've seemingly got them back in contention so early. I mean, if we can have these guys sort of fully integrated by after the World Cup, maybe, um, then that's really positive. And I think, I think you know, all things, um, you know, fingers crossed and everything, hopefully all things can come together and we can kick on in the second half of the season. But... Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I saw, um, speaking of managing injuries, just to touch on this, I don't know if you saw um, the report that's come out of Wolves where they noticed that Sasha Kalajic had a slight ACL tear in his medical and Wolves pushed with the transfer anyway. And then on his debut, they put him out. And what did he do? Tears his ACL. I saw that. It was like that came out of the Athletic. I was like, that's unbelievable. Um, like he, he can sue. <laughs> that's really, yeah. that's really bad. He should as well. Um, he should. Yeah. So um, yeah, you have to be careful how you manage these things. I just saw that today, and I thought that was worth mentioning because that is crazy. Um, but yeah, no, it's good to see all the boys back on the grass. And that those boobers come a lot earlier than expected. I didn't expect to be seeing that until about January. So yeah, that's very exciting, mate. It'd be interesting to see if boobers makes the World Cup at this rate because I think well, there have been murmurs, haven't there? You know, Kante is Kante's pulled out injured. Um, it doesn't look like Pogba's going to make it to the World Cup either. You know, it, it seems like this spot that was sort of opening up in any case for Booba is, uh, is you know, it, it could very well be there. It just depends how how fit we can get this guy and, and if Deschamps fancies taking it. I, I don't want to say a risk, but, you know, I don't, necessarily think that taking players who aren't fully fit to a tournament is the best of ideas ideally you know Booba has a nice month off and, and and rests and can train with us and and can sort of pick up the intensity I, I imagine there's going to be training games that are going to be had and there's going to be you know intramural friendlies that are organized with teams obviously we've got the the uh the Peter Whittingham game against Cardiff the charity one so You'd imagine some fringe players maybe get a go in that. But um, listen, if Bieber goes off with France and and potentially either wins the World Cup or gets, you know, raring to go, he's fully fit, ready for Boxing Day against, is it Liverpool or Spurs? Yes, um, Liverpool. Then that's an ideal scenario, isn't it, mate? And it would, I mean, when's the last time or any time really we've we've uh, we've gone into a World Cup and and had a French international repping Claret and Blue, mate? It's, it's fairly mental, isn't it? Yeah, that's crazy, mate. It really is. Um, so, yeah, I mean, as I said, I saw that if he does go, they're expecting that he can play quite a significant role as well, um, especially, as you say, with all those midfield injuries out. He's sort of one of the last 
anchors that, that France can really put into that midfield. So, yeah, here's hoping, mate. Um, I mean, it would be a very difficult, like, you know, to get back up to speed. So that might be, his, that might genuinely be his first game back. Um, yeah. Like, yeah, if, if depending on how this injury situation goes, it could well be in his first game back is, is France's opener in Qatar. Um, and that would be a, a bit of a baptism, baptism of fire for the guy. So, um, but no, it, w- it would be wonderful. And uh, it, it's going to feel like a new signing all over again when he comes back. And it's, it's the same with Diego. So, um, yeah, fingers crossed, mate. It is, man. It is. And that first game is against Australia by the looks of it on the 22nd of November. Day of recording today is the 27th of October. So, if he's fit and firing for that game and starting at the base of that midfield, then I guess we just have to marvel at the at the advancements in sports science, mate. It, it's honestly, it's it's remarkable. Again, I can't claim to know a lot about that, but um, injuries out of the way, mate. We've got obviously a very big game against Newcastle. Aaron Danks, Claren Blue Army. He's going to be in charge once again. Has the opportunity to be the first and only Villa manager with a one hundred percent win record. That is one for the history books. Aaron Dank's best win percentage at Aston Villa. Um, All jokes aside, mate, this is going to be a very tough test. I didn't realise, guys, in the last podcast, I've got to put my hands up. I didn't realise that that win against Tottenham raised Newcastle all the way up to fourth. Um, The point I made about the fans being somewhat underwhelmed with some of the results did ring true earlier on in the season, but they're sat in fourth on 21 points now, which is is crazy. And I guess, uh, you know, Eddie Howe, fair play, especially what you've done. I know you've spent probably around 200 million since you've come through the door, but that's the game now, isn't it, mate? And um, and this is going to be a very tough game because they're currently on a six-match unbeaten run uh, that contains four wins with wins against Tottenham. Obviously, recently they've beaten Everton. They recently beat Everton. Uh, they beat Brentford. Sorry, five-one. This is going to be <laughs> a very tough game, and St James's Park isn't a happy hunting ground for Villa, is it, mate? It's been a long time since we've last won there in the Premier League. And, it, you know, Halloween weekend, it has all of the of the ingredients to be an absolutely terrifying game for Aston Villa, doesn't it, mate? Yeah, mate. Uh, I'll flat out come out and say straight off the bat that I think we will still be without a manager with a 100% win record. Um, sorry, Aaron. I, I just can't see. I, th- I think we'll go and as long as we play well, um, you know, who knows, maybe you can get a draw or something like that. I just can't see us winning this game. Newcastle are oh, flat out a really good side. Um, you're right, mate. We, we last won away. And this is a stat I reference every single year. So if Villa could go and win, that would be great because I say this every damn year on the podcast. Uh, the last time we went away at Newcastle was 17 years ago. Um, that infamous... Lee Bowyer, Kieran Dyer, red card match, the whole Steve Taylor penalty incident. It's like that's the last time we won um, at Newcastle, which is shocking. Um, and I just, they're such a good, they're such a good side that you know. And this, you're right in saying that obviously Eddie Howe has spent a lot of money, but Newcastle is still doing really well considering Alexander Isak has picked up a lot of injuries. They're still yet to have Callum Wilson and Isak fit at the same time. Obviously, Alan St Maximan is is out as well. Um, so they've still got those guys to come back from fitness. And yeah, when, as you say, mate, the pits up some, some good results. Obviously, that three-all draw with Man City earlier on in the season stands out. It's pretty hard not to be quite hot on what Newcastle are doing at the moment. Um, and yeah, as you say, mate, un- unbeaten in six games. They've only lost once this season. Um, and that was a little while back now, I believe. And so, yeah, as, as I said, it's, it's one of those where um, you probably have to take your losses um, where you can get them and like as long as we play well and we you know that four two three one is is still encouraging. I'm not sure whether Unai Emery is going to actually be at St James's or whether he'll just be watching on TV. But it's interesting how football works. Football works in mysterious ways, man. And like for this to be like the first game, after, I know he won't be there, but for the first game after Unai Emery is appointed manager, for it to be at the club which he quite publicly turned down, like maybe just less than a year ago. Um, and then for his next two games to be against Manchester United, who are like the team that he beat, obviously, in that Europa League final to win Villarreal's one and only trophy in the club's history. Um, it's quite amazing sometimes how these, these fixture lists sort of play out. And um, yeah, it's it would be an interesting one in that sense. There's always a bit of needle between these two teams. We don't have that great record at St. James's. 
Newcastle are probably, honestly, maybe in that 17-year spell in which we haven't gone and won at St. James's, maybe barring those Pardew years where they sort of got into Europa League and stuff like that, maybe this is the best Newcastle side we've faced in that time. Um, so maybe the ask is, is bigger than it's ever been. Um, and yeah, as long as we go and, and we put in an encouraging performance, I think that will bode nicely going into that United double. It will, mate. And I mean, it's hard to believe that Miguel Almiron with six goals is the fifth top scorer in the Premier League this season. He took them Jack Grealish comments personally. He really did. It's uh, it's interesting to see as well how, uh, I think, you know, you look at a player like Kieran Trippier, how he's able to facilitate um, Almiron in this in this system that Newcastle used because you know he's he's kind of been coming off the right and Trippier of course we know is somebody who has fantastic quality when it comes to dead ball situations free kicks corners we all know what he did for England but um, you know defensively as well Trippier Trippier is kind of he's he's allowed Almiron to kind of to 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 be the guy who uh, not only sort of springs the counter attacks but you know, he kind of takes that defensive responsibility off him, um, which is is really impressive and is is certainly someone who I know we've kind of spoke about in previous years, mate, and gone, we think there's a player in here, but we don't know if we'll ever see it. He's, he's finally coming to fruition now. Um, and I think, again, you have, to, you have to credit Eddie Howe there because there's a lot of players that he's inherited from, you know, the Steve Bruce era, even before that. You know, when you look at like a Joel Linton as well as an Almiron, that he has legitimately made an, a better player through coaching and, and, and through playing an effective system. So it's interesting to see. And, and uh, you know, as you said, mate, it kind of adds a different dynamic to this game with it being with, with Emery sort of watching from the sides. And we heard in the week as well, I think it was from the, the Birmingham Mail that, Emery was on the phone to Aaron Danks the other day and he's going to be watching Manchester United's next two games. Uh, they've got a Europa League tie and then um, I'm not sure who they've got in the Premier League this, um, on the weekend, but um, Emery will be watching closely. And I think what's really interesting about the way Emery s- sets up in his system, and I know we kind of briefly touched on it, but I feel like we're probably, we probably owe these guys, Dan, a more detailed breakdown on Emery's tactics that maybe we'll do ahead of the Manchester United game, I think that's probably a good idea, um, is is the attention to detail that this guy puts in. And it's, I think that the word that's been used to describe his his four four two is is asymmetric that's been thrown about. So essentially how Villarreal set up, Chiquese is generally the wide man who stays wide. Uh, and then, more often than not, it was someone like Gio Lo Celso who'd play left mid, but it was almost inverted. And when Lo Celso was in possession, he'd almost be a part of a three. But essentially what his job was, was to kind of sit and, and cover where Alberto Moreno or, or, um, or uh, Jeremy Pino even would, would sort of bomb on the overlap. Pino is someone who we're going to talk about in another podcast, guys, don't you worry. Um, so it's it's interesting to see how that will maybe come to fruition because we know he he plays a uh, a four two three one or has done at least for Arsenal, but this asymmetric four four two, I feel maybe the the sort of the next evolution of of where Villa can be and and, and where Villa can go and it'll be interesting. I I don't know if he'll have said to Danks, listen, this is how I want you to play, or or you know same as last time, but the I th- I think the emphasis is really on being extremely compact in defence and al- almost preparing for the worst at any given time. And then using those two pivots, the two sixes in that midfield to really unlock the midfield and, and, and spring that counter-attack on. So it's going to be interesting, mate, especially when we talk about Kamara being a player who is is potentially going to be back within the coming weeks. Um I'm going to assume it's going to be another 4 2 3 1, mate. I don't know about you. I think the team picks yeah. itself, really. I know Dean's back, but for me, Ash keeps his place. Or if you are dropping a full back, maybe it's Cashy and you put you put Young back on, on the right, where I, I do think he is better, um, and, and give Luca a chance to impress. But um, this is going to be an interesting game, mate. This is going to be an interesting game. And obviously, there, there was a bit of a, a, a 
maybe a scandal. I think you can call it with the Callum Wilson goal. Um, I'm not sure where I stand on that, if I'm being completely honest. His goal against Spurs, uh, Lloris essentially runs into him, doesn't he, mate? Um, again, I'm not, I'm not really sure where I stand on that, but Wilson's a guy who, you know, he quite publicly, allegedly declined a move to Villa, whether we, whether we actually moved for him or not, that we don't really know the details, but um, he always seems to score against his mate. And I think his biggest issue has always been fitness. Can he be fit? Can he stay fit for a consistent amount of time? There's no denying the goal scoring abilities that he has, but um, he's generally always a handful for Ty and Ezri, isn't he, mate? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, look, on the lineup, I think it'd be quite, Quite cruel, really, not to go. With, I think you're right, mate. I think it will be an unchanged eleven. I think even for the best of times, I'm not sure whether Dina comes in from Ashley. I think Ashley is more than in that spot. Um, I think we'd only be putting Dean in there on reputation because his performance certainly haven't warranted it. So yeah, I think Ash Ash will hold down that spot, um, and rightfully so. And then yeah, I think I think Wilson will be a handful. Um, we will. I mean. Just briefly on Umar, Unai Emery's sort of lineup, there's some players which I think it really suits. And I think Leon Bailey um, is someone that, you know, or, or someone that hopefully can can really flourish in that kind of role. And as we're going to in another episode, mate, there are players which I do think um, there will be some red flags. Uh, I think there'll be some warning signs. I'm not sure how Coutinho fits into that kind of system. Um, and so, yeah, it would be really interesting to look into that in a bit more detail. Um, but yeah, obviously the Newcastle pack plenty of goal threat. They're capable of sort of taking games away from teams quite easily. We, on the other hand, do struggle to score goals in St James's Park. In the last twelve league games we've played there, uh, we've only scored a total of five goals, and only in twice in the last twenty six visits, twenty six visits, guys, have we managed to score more than once. Twice in the last twenty six. Um, that's shocking. That is shocking. I mean, it, it, it like, and so, yeah, it's a game where um, it's good that we've got Watkins has got that monkey off his back and he got that goal because otherwise you'd really like, you, you know, in an atmosphere like that in a game against Newcastle, like if, he, if that was going into that ninth game, which is his longest ever drought, in the Premier League has been nine games. So we would have been equal in that, going to one of the toughest grounds in the Premier League. Um, it wouldn't look great for our early. So it's good that he's got that. He's got a bit of confidence and hopefully he can play, uh, well, he can play better than we've seen him play recently, to be honest with you. But no, Ings, um, Ings is the guy. And I think he, uh, at the top of that 4-2-3-1, um, he's the one we'll be pinning our hopes on mostly. But no, it's, it's gone from a game, I think you have to take the positives, don't you, mate? It's gone from a game which... Um, had this game come two or three games ago, I would have been so worried about, so worried about. It could have been an like absolute mauling. But now, given the optimism that sort of floated through the club, you sort of go and you think we can make more of a contest of it, um, you know, and we can really give them a game and uh, and see what comes out the other side. But yeah, it's, it's amazing how football works, mate. And as I say, if this game had come literally just a few weeks ago, um, we could have been in the hand of an absolute mauling. Um, but thankfully, I, I think we can expect a bit more and uh, hopefully we can break some of these hoodoos, um, get a few players on the score sheet, hopefully, and, and make sure that, I mean, I can't wait to preview that United game. If it's United at home in Unai Emery's first game, uh, that would just be amazing, amazing. And if we can get a good result in this one to go into that, then that, it'll only make it better, mate. Mate, it really would. It really would. It's... Uh... It's it's almost it's the calm before the storm, really, isn't it? And yes. I think if if we can if we can make a, a very a strong account of ourselves again here today, then I'd be very happy. I think one thing as well I wanted to touch on. I think I know we've we've expressed our gratitude to Aaron Danks for the for the Formula win and the performance, but it's quite clear that the way that these deals when you look at sort of recruiting players and managers and, and how Villa certainly tend to do business or how we perceive Villa to do business at the very least, these things have clearly been going on for a while. And I think Emery needed time to, to perhaps agree to, or, or you know, to, to, to make sure he's fully in. And I think we have to shout out Aaron Danks for that performance because I think that probably convinced him. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he, maybe he already wanted to come back and maybe he already had a point to prove. But I kind of feel like these managers, 
I mean, like we, we said on podcast before, mate, why would you want to come to Villa when we're sat in 17th and it's looking as drab as it was? Aaron Danks give us the perfect advertisement of what a really what a, what a competent manager can achieve with the group of players that we've got. So shout out to Aaron Danks, shout out to Unai Emery. Um, and I mean, they got their replacement in fairly quickly, but around, mate. Uh, Kike Setin has taken over at the club. So yes. I think the fact that that was, that was done pretty quickly, Love I that. saw you shouting about that on Twitter, mate. Um, Love that. I think that kind of shows we communicated this pretty early on with with Villarreal and we've allowed them to get their replacement, you know, get their dogs lined up and uh, and bring Setin in. So, uh, you know, that's, that's a good thing for, for everybody involved, really, because obviously Villarreal benefit from the transaction. We've, we've given them £6 million for their manager and we're likely going to take you know a good a good chunk of their coaching staff as well but it almost kind of you know sometimes a, a, when a big club like Villa comes in it, it could be perceived that we're sort of bullying them do you know what I mean like so it's good to kind of see that they've been able to bring in in, in setting somebody who is a more than competent manager in the league as well comes in with a very big reputation so you know on a personal level I'm happy that we've not you know, completely yeah. annihilated this club's future. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right, mate. I, I mean, I'm really happy. Uh, just to speak briefly on that. I really like the Setien appointment. There were a few managers where I could, uh, you know, I thought they were going to go Setien, Pepe Bordelas, or um, Marcelinho. And they went, obviously, Lopetegui is, is free now as well. So there's a good like horde of, of Spanish managers they could turn to. But Kike Setien is someone that I've always really liked his teams. Obviously, he was most recently at Barcelona. Um, and so, yeah, it looks really good. And I don't know if you saw Guillaume Balague, mate, um, saying that, talking about um, Emery's assistant. And yeah. obviously, we haven't had that announced who his assistant manager will be. Um, but I was I saw Guillaume Balague say the other day, I wasn't sure where, um, said that, uh, he can't reveal who it is yet, but he's a European Cup winner. So he's won the Champions League and he has experience in the Premier League. Um, so let's get something going in the comments. <laughs> There's the Absolutely. criteria. There's the criteria. Um, have a guess at who it will be. Um, I saw so, loads of people were like, Xabi Alonso, Xabi Alonso. And I was like, guys, I think <laughs> I, don't, I don't think he's going to be leaving Leverkusen. Uh, I mean, he may want to, to be fair, after his start, uh, but... Fernando Torres uh, who knows it, it'll, be, it'll be really fun um, so yeah let us know in the comments guys who you think that might be have you, have you seen how jacked Fernando Torres is by the way mate yes he's huge he's he? like he a wrestler recognizable that. it's just when he went up and played in Japan it was like he was tearing up that league and he was like ah oh, I need something else to do apart from bullying these poor Japanese footballers so let's um, let's just get jacked <laughs> let's, let's make their hearing. life even more miserable and I can hurt yes. them even more now <laughs> not only am I absolutely lightning quick I now look like Arnold Schwarzenegger so yeah shout out to you Fernando I'm excited to see you on the touchline at VP soon <laughs> That'd be pretty mad, wouldn't it? I think he's coaching at Atleti now, isn't he? Coaching the youth yes, teams. Yes, under nineteen, um, I believe. Yeah, I, I remember. I remember seeing some photos of him at work. Um, not at work because I don't work <laughs> with him. Um, <laughs> but I, I remember seeing photos of him coaching um, the Atleti team, and I remember it's the first time I'd seen him in a while, and I was thinking, Jesus Christ, like, what have you been eating, man? Like, like <laughs> he's on the Popeye diet. Like it's just pure <laughs> spinach and eggs, man. This guy's huge. Um, but yeah, let us know who you guys think the assistant will be. Let us know your score predictions. Dan, you know I've got to do it, mate. I'm going to give you a score prediction first. I'm going to, I'm going to give you that. I'm going to say it's going to be 1-1. I think Villa can make a strong like account it. for themselves in this game. I'm going to like go with it. Leon Bailey getting another goal. But, you know, I back, we've backed Bailey for so long and I absolutely adore him. And he's the one Villa player. I, I spoke about this on the podcast to, to briefly speak about FPL. If you're not in our league, links in the description. When he gets a shirt at the end of the season. Leon Bailey is the one Villa player this year that I backed in FPL, right? And it was it was to my own detriment at the time. But he's since taken off. He's kind of, he's lost, I think, um, like 0. 0.4 in value. And obviously, he kind of went off. He got, I think, 13 points the other week. Uh, naturally, he's no longer in my team because, you know, they're the decisions that I've made. But I can't be too mad because I'm doing fairly well in my personal league. I think I'm ninth in the Villa Filler League. And I'm fairly high up in the money league that I'm in as well. So I can't, I, I can't have too many complaints, but it's one of them. When Leon scored, I was, I was elated. I was, I was buzzing. I was jumping for joy because I'm so happy. I'm this guy's biggest fan. But there was a little part of me that sank and was like, oh, 
I know the person below me has got Leon Bailey in his starting team this week in FBL. I just know it. Um, yeah, well, it says about, a lot about how hot I am on Newcastle, mate, because I've, I've, I've gone the triple, the three Newcastle players. That's obviously the most you can have in FPL. I've got three Newcastle players, and I don't have a single Villa player. So hopefully we can turn it around. I can get some more Villa assets back in my team. Because, yeah, like you, I've ummed and ahed on Bailey, and he's been in and out of my squad. Um, and, yeah, hopefully, mate, hopefully you can turn that corner. I'm looking forward to getting some Villa boys back in the team because it's pretty disgraceful that I don't currently. Mate, it is, it is, but it, that's just the game, mate. That's just the game. Do you know what's really funny? So, I've been, I've been running, I've been running my girlfriend's FPL team for her work league because they were like, just join it, like, like it'll be fun, whatever. Like, just get your boyfriend to do it. So, I've been running her FPL team right, and I didn't realize this until last week. She wasn't in my personal league, so I was like, right, let's get you in the Morgan Invitational. Put her in the Morgan Invitational. And she's got more points than me and she tops my own <laughs> league, which is obviously me because I'm making all the decisions. But it, if you look at the league table, um, Charlotte's got more points than me, which Shut is uh, it, it's, it's really poor. And it's funny because I've, I've taken, I've been way more like calculated for her. I've taken more risks on my personal one. And th- mm. listen, there's only about 10 points in it, right? I just found it really interesting. We had a bit of a stinker as well a couple of weeks ago. The... Her app, I think she was on a train and she didn't have enough signal. So her app glitched and she like captained Dominic Solanke or like it because it was default to that from when we made some changes. Um, she captained Solanke on a week that he blanks. We didn't get Kane and Haaland. Um, so we didn't get Haaland and De Bruyne out for the blank game week. And she's still above me, which is crazy. Um, I'm saying nothing. But exactly, man. Exactly. Guys, if you want to get involved in the Villa Villa Fantasy League, the link will be in the description of the podcast. Yep. Uh, again, a shirt will go out to whoever wins that at the end of the season. Um, and if either Dan or I win, then obviously we will give it away to whoever is beneath us. But Dan, you've had a you've had a pretty good few weeks, right, man? Yeah, mate. Yeah, I, uh, I've taken some gambles, um, and they're paying off. Anthony's been my guy. He obviously came in and scored in a few back-to-back games. Um, people call me crazy, um, but obviously um, Harland is is a doubt. Um, so we've all got that conundrum. Are we still do we do we stick or twist on on Erling Haaland for their game at Leicester? So it's going to be an interesting week in FPL. I'm currently sat in fifteenth. I think as long as both and I play, like you and I both place in the top fifteen, I think that's respectable. But if we make this yeah. league and um, you know we both finish lower than that, I think we can say to say we'll never do FPL ever again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Charlotte was loving your team name as well, man. It really. Oh, cheers! It really yeah, cracked her you. up. It really cracked her up. But um. It's a good one. Yeah. Again, if you're not involved, guys, get involved. Uh, we'll probably, I mean, the game's on Saturday, so we won't really know, but probably in the next, like wh- whatever the next podcast is, we'll kind of mention FPL and we'll give a shout out to whoever's on top. Um, I know Dan has finally been dethroned, Dan Horton. Um, he has. He's, he's he has. a good friend of the podcast That's and huge. an avid FPL player. So, so whoever it is, I mean, hopefully we can still shout you out on the next one um, for, for being above Dan, but well done because Dan is very good at FPL. Um, that's all I'll say. So yeah, uh, we're about to record another podcast, mate. So we should end this here. So if you've enjoyed, hit a like, comment your thoughts below, subscribe for more. Follow us on TikTok at Heart of the Hulk. Follow us on Instagram at Villa Villa Pod. Engage with the shorts. Villa Villa's taking over. Up the Villa. <laughs>